Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast. It's a show filled with family history research strategies and techniques, news and entertainment, and inspiration. And I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 190. And I am Lisa Louise Cook. Thank you for joining me and spending your day with me here today. You know, one of the things I love about what I do is that this show brings so many passionate, knowledgeable voices together in celebration of finding our roots. You all send me questions and tips that show how passionately you are searching out stories online, in archives, and in your own attics. I hear amazing stories about your discoveries. At conferences, I meet up with experts of all kinds, and in the Genealogy Gems podcast, I get to turn on my microphone, amplify all those voices, and bring them to you. I never fail to be inspired to find new ideas myself with every episode. Well, today's show is a great example of this. In a few minutes, you're going to hear a story about one genealogist who used his skills to help authorities lay to rest a 30-year missing persons case that was literally close to home. I'll share some great questions and comments from GEMS fans around the world. You'll hear about the new Genealogy GEMS book club title. It's a brand new book from a breakout British novelist. And the episode rounds out with a segment on why you should spend your next lunch break with Percy, the database, not a person, and another DNA gem from Diane Southard. Lots and lots to cover. But first, we have the genealogy news, starting with yet one more marvelous way to connect and learn online. You know, there's been a new trend for the big genealogy conferences. It's live streaming attendance for those who can't make it there in person. And we saw that tradition continue to grow at Roots Tech, where one of my sessions was streamed from their lecture hall. And I streamed even more sessions, of course, from our own Genealogy Gems Theater in the exhibit hall. Be sure to check out the show notes for links in case you missed those, uh, because you can still watch them online. Well, this year, the National Genealogical Society Conference, known as NGS, here in the U.S., is offering registration packages with remote access to 10 live streaming lectures during two days of its conference that run May 4th through the 6th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Better yet, those who register don't have to watch during the live broadcast. They'll have access to those classes for three months afterward. Well, one of my lectures, it's called How to Follow and Envision Your Ancestors' Footprints Through Time with Google Earth, was chosen to be streamed on Thursday. That's going to be May 5th of 2016. And that's along with four other sessions that day themed around researching land and locations. So those other sessions that you can tap into are Mapping Apps for Genealogists by Rick Sayer, Private Land Claims by Pamela Boyer Sayer, which is about the paper trail for legal ownership in territorial areas before they became part of the U.S., There's one called Are You Lost? Maps and Gazetteers for English and Welsh Research by Paul Milner, and Deed Books, More Than Just Land Records by Vic Dunn. Uh, The next day at NGS, that was on Thursday, the next day there's another live streaming series of five sessions, and those are going to be focused on research methodology, DNA, problem solving, and historical context. And there'll be presenters like Elizabeth Schoen Mills, Jeannie Bloom, Thomas Jones, David Rencher, and Stephanie Evans. Head to the show notes for this episode number 190, and there you'll find a link to all the information and the registration information. There is a deadline on this. It's coming up quick, April 22nd, 2016 at midnight. Over the past few weeks, we've seen some fantastic new genealogy records come online. So let's go on a whirlwind tour of them. You can use the links in the show notes to check them out. Of course, you're going to want to listen for places that your ancestors lived, but I encourage you also listen for record types that might inspire you to go digging for comparable records for your family in other places. Even if these aren't the ones you need, uh, it's a reminder about what maybe you should be looking for in uh, your ancestors' neck of the woods. So let's start down under where findmypast.com has updated collections of birth, marriage, and death records for Western Australia. 
Transcripts for all three record sets appear to be taken from original civil registrations beginning in 1841. Now let's uh, head over to Europe. FamilySearch.org has published nearly 3 million digitized images of deeds and mortgages for South Jutland, Denmark, dating clear back to 1572. For Yorkshire, England, Ancestry.com has added a collection of quarter session records that date to 1637 and probate records back to 1521. Find My Past has added about a quarter million more recent land tax records for Devon, Plymouth, and West Devon from 1897 to 1949. Now, let's touch down briefly in South America. Family Search has been doing a lot of work down there. Over 200,000 indexed records have been added to a free collection of civil registration records for Brazil, and those date back to 1804 at FamilySearch.org. And uh, we'll finish up our genealogy records tour in the U.S. About 1.3 million indexed records have been added to a free United States War of 1812 index to service records. And that's at FamilySearch.org. If you've got African-American ancestors, look to the 35,000 newly indexed records and images from the free collection of Freedmen's Bureau marriages at FamilySearch. And there are some statewide databases in the U.S., um, starting in the South. For Louisiana, Ancestry.com has updated its collection of wills and estate records back to the 1750s. About 75% of Louisiana's parishes are now covered on Ancestry.com. Swinging north and east, there's a new index for North Carolina civil marriage bonds and certificates back to the mid-1700s at Family Search. The same site has a new collection of Maryland church records that's even older. It's back to the mid-1600s. North to the Empire State, FindMyPast.com has updated its collection of New York State church records with baptisms, marriages, and deaths from dozens of churches from various denominations. And you can even search by denomination or church name. And then if we head west to Illinois, where nearly 200,000 total indexed marriage records back to 1805 are now on FamilySearch.org. And our last stop, the Dakotas, an index to records from North Dakota funeral homes hosted by the Red River Genealogical Society is newly indexed at Ancestry.com and it can be searched for free there or on the society's own website. And finally, the 1945 South Dakota State Census Collection at Ancestry, which is also available at Family Search, it's been updated. So I'm really pleased to see a 1945 census. So that's it. We're gradually pushing past that 1940 federal census blackout with state censuses like these. So be on the lookout for 1945 state censuses, perhaps in states where you research as well. Um, I'll have a link in the show notes. It's going to take you to a free article all about U.S. state censuses if you want to learn more about those. Next up in the news, Family Tree Maker Direct Import into Roots Magic. So a new upgrade to Roots Magic software allows the direct import of any Family Tree Maker file without the potential data or details loss that often comes from importing GEDCOMs between programs. Roots Magic 7.1.0.1, I know, lots of points in there, can actually now import more past versions of Family Tree Maker files than the current software Family Tree Maker itself supports. And this is a free update. It's for Roots Magic 7 users who can click on the update available indicator. It's in the lower right corner of the Roots Magic 7 program screen. Others can purchase Roots Magic 7, uh, which again has this import feature. Uh, it's amazing. So, really, so many different versions of Family Tree Maker are out there. If you've got one of them, chances are Roots Magic 7 can help you out with it. There's a link in the show notes and another with specific instructions on how to directly import your Family Tree Maker files into Roots Magic. All right, well, coming up next, we're going to hear from you, and we will do that at the mailbox. Bring me a letter. 
letter from my old hometown. One with some jokes from my old pal Jim Brown. Bring me a letter from that girl of mine, saying that she's longing for me all the time. Bring me a letter from my proud old dad, who knows that we are winning, and I bet he's glad, but more than any other, time to read some gems mail. I love getting mail from you gems. Uh, The first one comes from Carol, and she has a question about Coast Guard ancestors. She says, I love your helpful podcast. Thank you, Carol. She says, I'm researching Arthur Thomas Galpin, G-A-L-P-I-N. He was born the 6th of January, 1905 in Missouri. The 1930 census says that he was on the USCG Beale in the Coast Guard. And some of the research I've done, she says, looks like that the Beale was used to help fight prohibition. I sent away to the National Archives to hopefully get some information about his time in the Coast Guard. But frankly, the form I filled out was a little confusing, and I'm not sure I'll get anything back from them. Do you know of a podcast or some website that can help me research the Coast Guard during the 1930s, and what his job at the Coast Guard might have been? Well, Carol, one of my favorite resources, I've mentioned it many times here on the show, is to turn first to Google Books. So I ran a search. First thing I did when I got your email on USCG Beale, and the name of the ship was B-E-A-L-E. I put that in quotation marks, and I ran that search in Google Books. And there was one result. It was a PDF document with a brief history of the ship's design, service, and operational highlights. And it says that the ship was decommissioned as early as 1930. Google.com searching is the best way to locate, of course, any website that might have information out there across the web. So if you head to Google and you try the search Coast Guard history in quotation marks, again, the quotation marks tell Google that this must be an exact phrase, Coast Guard history, and that that phrase must appear on each search result that Google returns to you. So I put that and then I put a num range search. That was 1920.1935. No spaces. To Google, that's a four digit number that it's searching between 1920 and 1935. But of course, to us, that really represents a time frame years, right? And so if if a year between that 1920 and 1935 shows up on a website that also says Coast Guard history, then we're going to get that in the result. And I also added Beale, B-E-A-L-E, the name of the ship, in quotes. I didn't put the USS or USCG because I didn't know for sure how it would be stated on a website. The important keyword there is Beale. So I put that in quotes. And I got one result from the Coast Guard's website. It's called Cutter's Historical Bibliography. It's kind of buried in their website. And and a cutter is a type of ship. So it's the um, Cutter's Historical Bibliography. And that bibliography lists a lot of resources, including an article called Destroyer Beale. And it says that was printed in the Coast Guard magazine in August of 1930. And it's on page 32. Isn't that great? may not find the actual magazine on Google Books, but you're going to find a reference to it uh, in this bibliography. So it's called Destroyer Beale. It's in Coast Guard Magazine, August 1930 on page 32. For generally learning more about the Beale and the Coast Guard at that time, I would also recommend digging into newspapers.com. Check out newspapers and see uh, what you might find there. Uh, tried another Google search. Um, you might try Galpin, the surname, in quotation marks to make that mandatory. And also I put just Coast Guard. 
I didn't have the word history, just Coast Guard. So maybe a mention of somebody with the surname Galpin with a mention of the Coast Guard. Those are both in quotation marks, making them both mandatory in every result that I get. And then I did add 1925.1935 just to see, uh, kind of open up the span a little bit. Using his full name just brings up Carol's own online postings about him. But my guess is that he may not have been mentioned with his full name in the context of his service, right? So the search Galpin, just that surname, can target websites without eliminating too many. So if somebody's talking about uh, her ancestor with the last name Galpin in, in regards to his Coast Guard service, they they may not be saying Arthur Thomas, right? So that, that just kind of opens it up, but still keeps it kind of specific. Remember that even when Google searches don't directly answer one of your questions, they sometimes point you to people that can. The Google searches that I just mentioned repeatedly direct you to the official U.S. Coast Guard website, and a little browsing on the site takes you to a museum webpage and to an historian's office, so either of which might be worth a phone call, right, with a specific question. And a related Google search for Coast Guard Library, if you put that in quotes, brings up, what do you know, the United States Coast Guard Academy Library with an about page that has contact information for librarians and interlibrary loan materials. There again, we start online, and that uncovers what might then be available offline, and it helps us figure out how to access those offline materials. I would see whether or not that Coast Guard Academy library might have a special collections library or other resources to help research past Coast Guard members. And finally, here's a little P.S. to Carol. If you don't hear back from the National Archives, by all means, get on the phone and get someone to help you. That's what they're there for. And you'd be surprised how many people don't take that step. Be tenacious. Go give them a call. I also heard from Gail, and she wrote in with this question. I recently requested your free email newsletter. How often do the newsletters come out? I have yet to receive any communication. And I wrote back to her and explained to, to Gail that there could be two reasons that you might not see your weekly newsletter, which comes out every Thursday. And of course, they're packed with news and tips and all the things that we've got going on here at Genealogy Gems, so you don't want to miss it. And you might be having the same challenge as Gail. You signed up for the newsletter and you're like, uh, what happened? Where is it? Or you're, you're seeing it sporadically. Well, the first possibility is that the newsletters might be going to your Gmail spam. So if that's the issue, you can click on spam, which you'll see in Gmail in the left hand column, and check through there, look through and specifically look for dates, look for the last time it was a Thursday, right, whatever the date was on Thursday, and check and see if there are any emails from genealogy gems podcast at gmail.com. That's going to be the email address that it comes from. You can always also use Gmail's search box to search on the email address. And if you find one of our newsletters in spam, what you want to do is mark it as not spam, and then click and drag it and move it into your inbox or do the move, you know, click on the uh, file it and you can move to inbox. You want to tell Gmail, I don't want this landing in spam. I want it to show up in my inbox. And then one more thing, you want to make sure that you head to your contacts in Gmail. And really for any email service, if you add our contact email, genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com to your contacts, then your email provider knows, oh, she knows this person. She knows this entity that is sending in this email, and it won't nearly as often send it to spam. It shouldn't send it to spam at all. So adding us to your contacts will help a lot or anybody that you want to make sure that you're getting their emails. The second possibility is that the newsletter emails may be going to the promotions or the updates tab in Gmail. Have you noticed those new tabs? Well, they're not as new anymore, but they're easy to miss because we tend to focus on where it says inbox. And you don't notice that there are these other tabs. Um, There's social that could be for social media type emails. And one promotions or updates uh, might be called either one in Gmail. So by default, you are viewing only the emails that are in your inbox tab. 
But if you click the other tabs, the promotions or the updates, then you could look through there and see, did the Genealogy Gems newsletter get sent to Gmail, but land in one of those tabs and not in your main inbox? When you find it, click on the email and just drag and drop it on to the inbox tab. And that will drop it into your inbox, but it also alerts Gmail that you want our newsletter to land in your inbox and not over in one of the other promotional or updates tabs that you don't look at as often. So I sent um, this reply directly to Gail as well. And she replied to my suggestion with this comment. She says, you are awesome. Learning curve with Gmail. (laughs) And then she says, I'm guessing others may benefit from understanding more about how Gmail works. And she's absolutely right. It's a really powerful tool. It's an excellent email provider. It does continue to evolve. So we have to kind of keep up to date. But it has a wonderful way of archiving your email so you don't get overwhelmed. You can hang on to stuff by tagging it with keywords and then kind of archiving it away so it's out of your inbox, but you still have access. And of course, you've got that fantastic search box in Gmail that's just as powerful as the Google search box that can help you retrieve emails through keywords. And you can use search operators just like we were talking about on our Coast Guard search. You can use those same things like the quotation marks in searching out your own email. So there's an entire chapter on using Gmail. It's in my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox, second edition. And uh, I conduct a lot of my own genealogy correspondence by email, of course, ordering obituaries from libraries and corresponding with cousins, contacting societies and archives when I'm hunting down um, records. And Gmail helps me sort those out and even keyword search them, like I said, using the search box. So if you're feeling a little bit like Gail, you might want to check out um, that chapter. It's it, it, The whole entire chapter is dedicated to Gmail in the Genealogist Google Toolbox. And that's available, of course, in our Genealogy Gems store. Here's a final piece of email, and I'll just read part of it. Uh, it's from a brand new listener named Nick, and he's from the Netherlands. And he wrote in to say, I've been hooked on your podcast for a couple of weeks. And apart from the great tips and tricks, like the use of Evernote to keep track of your research... The thing I probably love the most is that you're so genuinely interested in other people's stories and ancestry. This is something that I recognize in myself as well. I always love the stories other people tell about their family, especially when they're also doing research into their family. About three years ago, my father got diagnosed with skin cancer. And to help him get his mind off of things, I opened up an account on my heritage for us so we could start working on our family tree together something we have both been interested in, but never actually started doing research. Maybe I have some tips that could be of some value for your listeners with roots in the Netherlands. Well, Nick generously sent several tips on understanding Dutch records and traditions. It's terrific. And I've shared those on the Genealogy Gems blog. I'll have a link in the show notes for you, taking you directly to that blog post. You can also do a search on Netherlands in the search box on our website. That'll get you there as well. Um, So if you've got Dutch roots, be sure and take a look. Thank you so much, Nick, for sharing your expertise. And um, good for you for getting together and getting started on MyHeritage. Sounds wonderful. I'm so glad that you found the podcast and uh, keep listening. We're, We're really glad to have you here. And next up, you're going to hear directly from two Genealogy Gems fans whom I met at Roots Tech. And the first is Celeste, who has a Google search success story. Hi, Celeste. Hi. You were in my Google class yesterday. I was, yes. And I told everybody, it's a sleepless night tonight. You've got work to do. Did you go home and do it? We, as soon as we got back to the hotel, we pulled out our iPads and pulled up Google started searching. And so who were you looking for? I was looking for Clara Dorothy Powell Higgins. I knew that she died in 1898 when she was 26 and I could not find any death record information. And so I did a, and I knew she died in Ohio and I did a a search with the county, Jackson County, Ohio in quotations, and then a num range search within two years of when I knew that she had died and I pulled up a Ohio State history page and it had links to all kinds of um, categories of records and I found one and she was listed as Dorothy Higgins and not 
Clara D. Higgins or Powell. But I was able to find her, and I knew it was her because she was buried in the same cemetery with her mother-in-law, and it was in the same town where I knew that she had lived and where her son had been born just two years before. A genealogy happy dance at night? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is so cool. I love hearing. See, that's the key. You can go to the class and you can learn about it, but there's a piece I can't do, and that's to do the doing. And that's what you did, right? Awesome. Yes. Thank, thank you. you so much for telling us. Thank you. Doesn't that just make you want to Google someone on your family tree? Oh, how wonderful. I'm so happy that Celeste shared that with us. And of course, we've got lots of Google strategies here at Genealogy Gems for you and in my book. And here's another conversation that I had with Jillian, who came to Roots Tech all the way from Ireland. Jillian offers a fascinating perspective on adoptee rights in Ireland and what it means to her to know who she is. All right, so our very first person here at Roots Tech is all the way from Ireland. Say your name. Uh, Gillian Van Turnhout. And we saw each other on Twitter or Facebook or something, and you told me you were here, and I'm so glad you stopped by. And how is it, and and what are you doing with genealogy, and, and how do you know genealogy gems? I got interested in genealogy because when it was my parents' 40th wedding anniversary, we'd run out of ideas for presents, so we bought them a course in genealogy. So they went on this course and they came home with homework and stuff to do and they gave it to their dutiful daughter who started doing it and doing Licky Bits Extra and I got more and more involved in it and they sort of said, okay, we'll come and travel with you wherever you want to go and find our family history, uh, but you, you do the work and the rooting. So uh, the, my mum is here with me in Salt Lake City, uh, so that's what drove me here and then parallel, um, I'm a member of the Irish Parliament, a senator in Ireland and the right to identity, about adoption rights we about 50,000 people in Ireland who don't have access to their records to find out who they are and so I'm fighting to have legislation uh, with my colleagues uh, that we would ensure their right to their identity so I suppose it's a twin track approach uh, that has brought me here and I want to see if we can get as many records in Ireland released to ensure people will know who they are and where they're from Adoption is always such a a volatile topic, if you will. But, you know, you and I were just talking about the fact that um, no matter the hardships that came before and that kind of thing, there is a, a human need to know just kind of where you're from. Even if you love your adoptive parents and you've had a wonderful life, there's still that missing piece, isn't there? Yeah, I, I think we need to stop adding any stigma to the fact that somebody's adopted. It is a fact. And I think those of us who are into genealogy can get that because you, you, you trace the facts and the evidence and you know you're only getting a very thin sliver of somebody's history. Right. So you can't judge a person and their history or what happened. But you do need to know that. And you, you don't have a right to necessarily a relationship, but you do have a right to know who you are and you have a right to know that identity. And I think we need to remove the stigma about somebody being adopted. It is a fact. And we need to release records and allow them to deal with those facts. Because for me, who I came from, you know, my mom and dad, very steady family, thought I had no interest in my roots and where I came from. And when I found out more about it, I became more and more increased in confidence, especially looking at women in my family history. So that helped me. Now, I'm coming from that secure family background, knowing who I am. I've met so many people adopted who just want to know names and places, very simple details, and I think it's the least we can do. And it helps bridge the gap, because I'm sure when you don't have access, somebody's actually stopping you, that makes you very different, right? It just, it puts you in a whole different category, and why should anybody be in such a different category, uh, just because of something that they didn't have control over? Well, fascinating work in Ireland, and of course you said that you've been listening to the podcast across the pond. I love your podcast, <laughs> and uh, you always, you know, even when I'm listening, saying, oh, I'm not really interested in this area, and then a gem sparkles, <laughs> and that's why you call it genealogy gems, because that's Right. that's what you do you ensure you're always bringing us those little treasures and rooting them out so thank you so much yeah, Lisa Louise. and I appreciate hearing that from you because we do have listeners in Australia and Canada and Great Britain and we try to cover across the pond but you know all the different areas but in reality I'm so happy that the concepts are sparkling even when that particular record has nothing to do with your background yeah. isn't it just the techniques right yeah. yeah well wonderful I'm so glad you came by thank you thank you so much you got a whole couple of big days ahead of you <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. I'm looking forward to it. You know, that's not the first I've heard about adoption in Ireland. Check out the show notes. Um, you will find there a letter from someone else who was frustrated about all the secrecy. 
and who sent in an overview of Irish adoption policy. Thanks so much to Jillian and Celeste and Nick and Gail and Carol for writing in. You know, your questions may very well be somebody else's questions as well. Thanks for sharing. Our sponsor for this episode is My Heritage, which has over 70 million members worldwide. If you're serious about making connections in the country where your ancestors once lived, hands down, My Heritage is the place that you want to be. Post your tree on My Heritage and start to see the magic as they automatically match it up with other trees, not just with genealogists in the country where you live, but around the world. Trees aren't primary sources, but they are excellent leads. I uploaded a portion of my family tree that contains my German heritage, and that's where I was really hoping to make a breakthrough, and very quickly it happened. I received a message from a distant cousin in Germany. That was my first international cousin contact. But there's more at my heritage. Their unique and powerful search system, it's called Record Matches. It constantly calls over 5 billion historical records for your family. It's the only family history interface out there using semantic analysis to search newspaper articles, books, and other free text documents. It is also the first to translate names between languages. Find out what MyHeritage can do to help you grow your family tree. Visit MyHeritage.com. It's free to get started, so there's really no reason to wait. And there are billions of reasons to try it out. Visit MyHeritage.com. squarely focused on finding your own family. And when one day, fate steps in and sends you in search of a family that you have absolutely no connection to. And that leads you to using your genealogy sleuthing skills to help the police solve a 30-year-old mystery. Ah, it sounds like a novel. But that's exactly what happened to my next guest, Scott Fisher, who also happens to host the Extreme Genes radio show. Welcome to Genealogy Jump, Scott Lisa, it's great to be on with you. How are you? Doing great. And I love this story. Uh, you and I got together at Roots Tech uh, 2016, and we were chatting, and, and you were telling me this story. You sent me some links, and it's riveting. So I'm really happy to have you on the show today to share it with the listeners. I know they're going to love this. Take us back to the beginning. So you're driving down the highway near your home, and what happens? Well, it's less than a mile from my house, and I'm, I'm going by, and I see... Uh, There is a a gentleman pulled over to the side of the road, and there's a little gully off to the right, and there's a a police car right behind him. And uh, there's there are two people with their hands on their knees looking down at something. And I thought, well, did a hiker fall? This is in February, but there was no snow last year. It was a very dry year. And uh, I thought, well, the authorities are there. There's nothing I can do to help. So I just kept going on. Well, hour or two later, I wanted to run off to the store. I went by the same way and there's like 20 or 30 squad cars there. And I'm thinking, what is going on? And uh, the sheriff was there kind of directing traffic because it's, it's just a, a narrow road right near a state road. And uh, he's a friend of mine. And I, I stopped and asked him what has happened. And he said, well, we, we've, we found a skull, a, a human skull has oh. been found here. 
And it apparently had rolled down the hillside. There's just a hillside of trees there. And up at the top, about 30 feet up, there was a flat top. And uh, there's been a housing development put in there uh, some time back. So, of course, initially we're thinking, well, perhaps this is a, a Native American burial from some time back. But as it turned out, they were able to determine, no, this is actually of, of a more modern era because uh, they had there were fillings in the teeth. Oh, wow. And probably, I'm guessing, the teeth is what led them to discovering who this person was? Exactly. The sheriff was thinking that perhaps this was a victim of Ted Bundy because he had been through here mm-hmm. in Utah uh, many years ago and and had uh, several victims here. And they were thinking maybe this is one of the missing young women. He said he thought, well, it's either uh, it's either a very small male or it's a woman. And so uh, over the next few weeks, we'd run into each other now and again, or we were at an event uh, with each other, and and I'd get caught up on it. And he'd said to me at one point, well, it's not a Bundy victim, and we've identified who this person is, and uh, we we hope to bring closure to this family here in the next week or so. So over the next week or two, I was listening uh, on various radio reports, waiting to hear what might be the result of that in the family being contacted, and, and nothing came up. So I gave him a jingle and said, what, what's going on? He said, we can't find the next of kin. Uh, it, it's 30 years old. She was from back east. And, and uh, I said, well, you, you know, uh, Sheriff, uh, like Liam Neeson, I have a particular set of skills. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I said, if you would like, I'd, I'd be uh, happy to help you out with that. And so he said, yeah, go for it. And so as you would, Lisa, you start out with what you know and you go to what you don't know. So he told you the name of this woman. They had identified her. Who was this? Yes, the name of the person was uh, Teresa Greaves. And uh, Teresa had been missing since 1983. I think I got that right. It was 32 years as of last year. So it was 1983, August of 83. She had moved from New Jersey after high school to Utah with a friend. And she was a big fan of Donnie Osmond. And uh, wanted to see a different part of the country, so she came out here, and she'd been here for a few years. And she went for a job interview in Salt Lake City one day, and uh, then made a phone call from just north of Salt Lake around noon, and then was never seen or heard of ever again. Was the skull far from where she was living at the time, or where she had been with the job interview? It was about uh, 10 or 15 minutes north of there. Wow. Wow. So you know who she is now. Uh, They realize this is a really old case. Yes. Where did you start in trying to identify uh, who her next to kin were? Well, every state has a a missing person site. And so I went to the one for Utah and uh, looked her up. And it gave some interesting information about this. First of all, it started with her birth date, which, Mm -hmm. of course, gives me an idea of, okay, what's her age? And it also mentioned that she was wearing a high school ring from... Uh, a class from a high school in uh, southern New Jersey, not far from Philadelphia, Collingswood, New Jersey. And so uh, I I looked that up, and then I went to Facebook and found that Collingswood High School in uh, Camden, New Jersey, had a Facebook page for their class of 77, which she would have belonged to, born in 1959. I calculated out, well, she must have graduated in 1977. Pretty simple math. Right. And as I went to that p- Facebook page for the class of 77, I was fortunate that the person who administrates it is a real estate agent. And a- as a realtor, of course, you want your phone number out there. So he listed his phone number right there. And I was able to give him a call and explain to him the situation. And he was uh, taken back by that. He said, gee, we were aware that uh, Teresa wasn't coming to reunions. We just thought we couldn't get a hold of her, that she didn't want to be found, but we had a, no idea that she was a missing person and certainly didn't know anything about this. You know, that's, that's so interesting how genealogy has changed, that your, one of your first steps was to go straight to Facebook. It really has changed, hasn't it? It really has. I don't know how this would have come about you know, 10, 15 years ago. I mean, it's just a lot right. different. And so he went out and, and sent out an all call to the class members from uh, 77 and found one gal named Debbie Vevers, who had been a classmate of uh, Teresa's. They used to sit in the back of classes and kind of cut up together. But she said, we weren't real close friends, but we were we were buddies. 
Mm-hmm. And when she heard the news, she just cried and cried. She said it was just devastating to hear. And uh, she called me and, uh, you know, I explained to her what we were you know, trying to do, reconnect with the family and, and asked if she'd be willing to help. And she said she would. And she said, you know, the, the high school yearbook for that year lists the home address of every senior. Boy, there, there's something, Lisa, you wouldn't see wow. every day. You don't see that anymore. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. But it was listed there. And I said, well, I think it would be a great idea if maybe you were able to go over into that neighborhood and knock on some doors and find some people who may have known her back at that time and get the name of some of the family members that she was with. And she did. And she found a gal who used to play with her when she was a girl. And apparently uh, she would come down from northern New Jersey where she lived with her family and uh, would spend the summers with her grandmother and a couple of great uncles who lived in this little house. And she liked it so much down there and the people down there, she decided to move down to go to high school there. And so that's how she came to go to that school and, and live in, uh, in Camden. And so as a result of that, now we had an idea, okay, these are the people. They were a grandmother, a couple of great uncles. And she took it a step further and went to the local courthouse and looked up who bought the house when uh, and then who sold it when. And so we wound up getting five names as a result of that, uh, which was very helpful to me. I said, that's, that's all we need. Thank you very family much. Names. Yeah. Family names. And right, so right. we got the name of the grandmother, a couple of the uncles, and then immediately went, of course, to the 1940 census mm-hmm. and found, uh, this family we even went back a little further to start putting names together. Who might be where found the name of a man, uh, Joseph, who, could have been the father of this girl or an uncle or an older brother. I wasn't sure because of the the age situation. He would have been born around 1935 and Teresa was born in 1959. So it was uh, a little bit confusing. And I found a listing for him online uh, on the white pages. And he was down in the Virginia area and it, it listed an address for him. And so I passed that along to the authorities. They went to the Virginia authorities And uh, they said, uh, no, that place doesn't exist anymore. That was a senior center, and they've torn it down. It's gone. So back to ground zero, back to the beginning, (laughs) we found an obituary for the grandmother. She had been buried in Virginia. She had uh, lived down there with her son. And through white pages, I was able then to follow him and and find out that this, that turned out to be her uncle, had moved to Florida. And once again, the same situation came up. I got an address, passed it along, and they said, nope, that that person isn't there anymore. And in this case, it later turned out to be the fact that it it seems the Florida authorities really didn't want to get into it because he was at that address. (laughs) Oh, my God. I know. And so it caused a lot more work. And you you would probably think, as I would, that this was something that was going to come together fairly quickly. Uh, But that wasn't the case. This kind of dragged on and on. I thought I'd have it within a week, maybe 10 days at the most. But Mm -hmm. uh, we got to the two-week mark, and uh, I'm struggling because now when you start to make phone calls to anybody down in Florida and they see an out-of-state area code, they think it's a solicitor. So they don't take the calls. That left me in the position of, okay, do I want to leave a message about this for somebody? Do I just tell them the story? Yeah, you've got a, a deceased relative and, and we're trying to, you know, what do you do with that? Right. And so uh, I continued to work. As you know, if you work with the white pages, it will often tell you who are people that they might be related to. And you're talking about the website, whitepages.com, which is a great people directory website. It is. And, you know, unfortunately, as we both know, there are fewer and fewer people who have landlines. But right. among seniors and people in Florida, there are more of them with landlines than you might find anywhere else. But there were more names that would come up. And so I started working some of these names and nobody would answer the, the phone. And I was getting very frustrated uh, and, and more and more determined. You know how it is when you get to that brick wall and you go, I'm so close. I'm just going to put a jackhammer through this thing. (laughs) And uh, so I I tracked down this one gal and her name came up matched with somebody else. And I found a Facebook page for this man and it didn't mention her. And I kind of determined, okay, this family member used to be married to this guy. And so we started creating a chain of potential relatives 
And the way it turned out was I had to leave that very awkward message on the answering machine of the ex-mother-in-law of the uncle's daughter-in-law. Wow. <laughs> and, and it was just one of those things where you're just going, oh, I can't believe yeah. doing this. I'm going to have to do it because nobody will answer and nobody will take the call. But I got a message machine. And so, you know, very humbly explain the circumstances. And so this, uh, this lady was uh, still close to her ex-daughter-in-law and gave her a call and said, is everything okay in your family? Oh, she right. said, well, well, why is that? She said, well, I just got this very unusual message. And she said, yes, my, my husband's cousin disappeared 30 years ago. Wow. And so she knew it was the real thing. And so she picked up the phone and gave me a call. It was three weeks to the day from when I had started. And um, it was very emotional, Lisa. You know, oh, I bet. Get that because, you know, at this point, I know so much about her. I've got photographs of her from the missing person site. I know that she came out here looking to start a, a new life away from a, a family, I guess, that presented some challenges for her. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I got that call. And then eventually another cousin called. She said, oh, I'd heard about this and I thought it was a scam. I said, wouldn't you want to call and find out that, you know? Yeah, really. I mean, come on. And she told me that Teresa had had a half brother and that he had lived up in New Jersey and that he had to have been deceased. And I said, now, why would you think he's deceased? She said, well, because he was morbidly obese years ago and we just couldn't imagine that he could live to this time. And so as we were talking, I'm poking around now on the Social Security death register. Right. And, and there's no sign of him there. There's no obituary online for him. And I said, you know, I don't see any indication here that he, he's passed. Mm -hmm. And so she went about looking and uh, actually uh, found uh, what looked like a deserted Facebook page for him, and she got in touch with him. And so we were now able to find Teresa's half-brother. And uh, here's the twist in this whole thing, Lisa, that was really unique. Yep. Teresa's body was found nine-tenths of a mile down the road from my house. This man had lived most of his life in a house that was nine-tenths of a mile from the house my father grew up in, in northern New Jersey. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, it's that genealogy serendipity, that, you know. That, that twilight <laughs> zone thing. And, it's just, yeah. and I scratch my head to this day thinking, what does that mean? You know, I don't know, but it's just the strangest thing. Bogota, New Jersey, you talk about a small town and that we would have this connection back to it. It's, it's just absolutely astonishing. And so n now they've been waiting for the release of the remains of Teresa because they needed them. There were some actual clothes found in the shallow grave. The grave was at the top of that little hillside. And That's somebody back then, before there were any homes had actually entered through some kind of gate. And they were able to actually hide what they were doing by getting below the, the level of the hilltop and hiding behind the trees. So nobody could ever see anything. No one would ever have any reason to go there. And uh, it was within view of a state highway, but it was hidden by the trees. So there, were, there was DNA they were trying to gather from it. So it's been an entire year now. And I was just told a week or so ago that the remains are ready to be released and the family is ready to receive them. Uh, the beauty of this thing was the, the love that so many people had for this family. In fact, when nobody could be found, her high school class did a fundraiser among their members and raised over $3,000 to help with the burial and, and a, proper, uh, a proper memorial for Teresa. Uh, which they have since passed on to the family. And, of course, the family is extremely grateful for it. Oh, absolutely. What a wonderful story. And, I mean, and it really illustrates how it does take kind of a village, if you will. It takes people who are willing to take action, like you, like the people that you contacted. And that, you know, it, it was such a mystery. I mean, you really reconstructed an entire puzzle there. You know, when I was a kid, my favorite books were the Hardy Boys series. <laughs> oh, right. You know, I was just seeing on uh, some website, they were talking about how the Hardy Boys were precursors to so much of the technology and the forensics and things that go on today. It's it's funny looking back. So not a surprise. I think so. I, I thought back, I thought, this is so cool to be involved in a homicide case. I think it's a skill that, 
you know, that we all could use in something like this that could be of help to local authorities who may not deal with this kind of situation all the time. And it was a great honor that uh, the sheriff would trust me to do that. They eventually gave me a a lovely award uh, at an end of the year banquet thing they did. And uh, it was very humbling, you know, especially when you saw some of these other um, officers who had done so many truly heroic things over the course of the year. And it was like, uh, me for this? I don't think so. But, <laughs> but it was uh, it, it was awesome. And I'm looking forward to the day now where Teresa's remains can be put to rest with her grandmother, who is, she was very close to uh, in a cemetery in Virginia. Well, that's wonderful. And it shows that there's always hope you know, to get answers. And I'm sure that the closure was probably so critical for the family. Well, and think about it. There was no DNA testing to this level you know, Right. Not that long ago. And and so the fact that the other reason that this uh, this skull was found was that there was a jogger running by the area and there was no snow last year. So here was February 5th. And so he he had seen this white something kind of down in the mud down there a couple of times as he had jogged by. And this time he he said, what is that? And went down and picked it up and just dropped it in horror. Yeah, I bet. And, you know, and made the call. Oh. But because of the weather circumstances uh, and obviously, the the remains had been disturbed by animals over time. This became available, but the circumstances, the timing was right so that they could identify who she was or possibly even who the person was who committed this uh, heinous act. And they actually have a couple of suspects in mind right now. They're working on it. But as you can imagine, I mean, it's a very old case. But we've seen them be solved before. I, I know I talk about in one of my presentations, my cold case presentation, that uh, one of the oldest murder mysteries solved ever wasn't solved with DNA. It was solved with, through a timeline. And 50 years later, they were able to put the man away. So, I mean, wow. you know, there's always hope. Wow. So what in the world do you do when you're not solving crime mysteries? <laughs> <laughs> Tell us. Like you, I'm working on my radio show and tracking, yeah. of course, uh, my own ancestry and trying to break down those brick walls. And what do you have coming up on Extreme Genes? I know you've got, uh, is this a weekly show, correct? Yeah, we're on every week. We're on uh, right now 31 stations around the country. And then like you, we do it as a podcast after the weekend has passed. And uh, we have guests on uh, covering preservation, uh, discovery, and sharing as well. And because otherwise it's just, you know, well, let me tell you about my family or let me tell you about my grandma. <laughs> but boy, the, the stories are pretty much universal. And, and that's, uh, I think, what is really a highlight for people. Well, fantastic. Well, you can visit Scott at ExtremeGenes.com. And Scott, thank you so much for taking time out and visiting with us today here on Genealogy Gems. Oh, it's just a thrill to be on your show, Lisa. Thanks for having me. believer in taking responsibility for the life and the future of my genealogy data. So instead of only uploading my information to somebody else's genealogy website, I enter it into my own master database that's on my own computer into the premier genealogy software program. It's Roots Magic at RootsMagic.com. Genealogy software is Roots Magic's primary focus. It's not just a sideline with them. And I continue to be really impressed by their free online training videos and all the rich features that they continue to add. And here's the latest. Not only can you import a JetCom file from another program, but now with the release of Roots Magic 7.1, you can directly import any Family Tree Maker file with everything attached. In fact, Roots Magic can import a bigger variety of older Family Tree Maker files than any single version of Family Tree Maker itself. It's just one way that Roots Magic has been reaching out into the genealogy community, helping them care for their most precious data, their family tree. And there's even more to look forward to this year as Roots Magic has announced an agreement with Ancestry and will soon be able to synchronize your family tree with Ancestry the same way that Family Tree Maker did. There's never been a better time to switch to Roots Magic. Head to RootsMagic.com and download the free Roots Magic Essentials today. You know, now that I've moved to Texas and what they lovingly call Tornado Alley, 
I'm more aware than ever that if anything ever happened to my genealogy files, I would be devastated. And boy, have my files expanded since I started this research at the ripe old age of eight years old. As genealogists, we don't just have paper files anymore, but we also have digital files like our genealogy database and precious old photos that we've spent hours scanning. No matter where we upload our family tree or anything else relating to our family history on the web, the responsibility for the total safety and security of our files lies with us. That's why I'm so proud to announce that Backblaze is now the official backup of Lisa Louise Cook and Genealogy Gems. For the past few years, I've been researching and I've been test driving backup services and hands down, Backblaze is my choice. It's certainly the easiest service to use. And I love their free app that allows me to access all my files on my smartphone and my tablet. Plus, it backs up everything, including my video files. Yikes, I didn't realize before looking at Backblaze that other services skip over backing up videos. So don't wait another day to ensure that all your files are safe and secure. Back them up like I do with Backblaze. Head to backblaze.com slash Lisa and scroll down. You'll see my smiling face there and a great offer. Just 50 bucks for a year's peace of mind and the best cloud backup around. Go to backblaze.com slash Lisa. Hello, it's Sunny Morton, contributing editor and book club guru here at Genealogy Gems. I'm excited to come on the show today to announce the next featured title for the Genealogy Gems Book Club. I've gotten some great suggestions from many of you in the past few months and have had a delightful time reading my way through your list. The title I've got for you today is Hot Off the Presses. It's the much-anticipated second novel by British author Helen Simonson. Helen's debut novel, Major Pettigrew's Last Stand, became a New York Times bestseller and has been translated into 21 languages. Her newest book, The Summer Before the War, is one of those great reads. It's light and charming with a dash of romance and humor. It's really easy to read and love. Let me tell you first about Beatrice Nash. I love her. She's the main character, a woman who has recently lost her father. She spent her lifetime traveling with him and is quite well educated. In fact, she's being brought to town as a Latin teacher to a small village in England. She finds to her dismay that it is not actually okay with everyone on the school governing committee that she's here as the Latin teacher because that position is traditionally for a man. She finds she has to navigate local politics pretty carefully to keep her job, all while fuming with frustration that because of her father's estate and those who administer it, she's lost control over her own funds and freedom and essentially her financial future. She does meet a man who is quite to her taste, and she seems to be to his taste, but just one of the problems with him is that he's already engaged. But this isn't just Beatrice's story. You'll meet an entire village full of charming and irascible and expatriate and unconventional and sometimes way too conventional and mysterious characters, including the local gentry and the local gypsies. They all have their own stories, which unfold as they all begin to experience the first great shock of the 20th century close-up, the realities of World War I. First, it's the stunned refugees who enter the quiet village in which the story is set, and the drama that unfolds as the village tries to rally and care for them. Eventually, you'll see a little bit of the battlefront through the eyes of a few characters who enlist, not all of whom may make it home. Despite the realities they face, this is somehow still an easy and charming read. I don't know quite how the author does it, but I think I'll ask her. Helen Simonson will join us in June to talk about the summer before the war. For a link to the book, see the show notes for this episode or the Genealogy Gems Book Club webpage at www.genealogygems.com where you can click on the book club page.
Well, that's it for Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 190. Hope you enjoyed our stories and information and all the new records. There was a lot to cover. A couple more things I want to let you know about before I let you go is if you are a Genealogy Gems premium member, and I hope you are, we've got a brand new video for you. Um, You'll find it when you sign in to the premium videos page, sign into your membership and go down to the organization section and you'll see hard drive organization in those videos. This new one is called Beyond Family Tree Maker, how to take control of preserving your family tree information. This is an important one. Uh, It's an important topic. I've been talking about it on the Genealogy Gems blog. And this half hour video we did originally for a Family Tree University virtual conference, and you get it as part of your membership. Um, So check it out. This is my method, my process for setting up my database, my backup, and really my mindset on the approach that I take to making sure that I'm in control of my genealogy data. And that's something we all need to be is personally responsible and in control of our data, not just uploading it to all the websites out there hoping that they don't go away. You know what I'm talking about. So that's new. Um, That's really one of the most important videos I think we've had on there in a long time. So be sure and uh, watch that. And let's see here. Also, I want to let you know that my new book, Mobile Genealogy, how to use your smartphone, your tablet for doing your family history research. It's now available as an ebook. And I know I've had lots of particularly international um, listeners asking about that. The thing was, we wanted to make this an EPUB this time, uh, which makes it more universal, something that can get out to all the different um, stores and such. And we have it available at our store. And it's It's a longer process (laughs) to get that all done and approved by all the powers that be. So the EPUB is available at our Lulu store. So all you have to do to get there, Lulu is just a a place right now where we have our digital eBooks, but we are upgrading our stores. Keep an eye out for that. I don't know when you listen to this. What you'll want to do is head to genealogygems.com and click on store in the menu. You might see our existing store or you might see the brand new one. What we're trying to do is get all of our products in one place. As it is now, we have our print materials out of our store on our website. And then you have to click over to our Lulu store to get our digital ebooks and digital guides. That's changing. We found a new store that we can merge this all together and take care of it all in one place for you. And we're going to be offering some new digital products there. Just keep your eyes open. We'll be talking about that more in upcoming episodes. But the ebook of the new mobile genealogy book is out. So I want to make sure that you know about that. And what else is going on around here? There's just, it's moving so quickly. You know, we've got so many projects in the works. Um, The way to keep track of all of this is being signed into our Genealogy Gems newsletter. That's the weekly newsletter. It comes out on Thursdays. We talked about how to make sure that it makes it into your inbox earlier in this episode. But that is really the best way to stay in touch with us. And finally, if you listen to this podcast on the Genealogy Gems app, then the big benefit of having the app on your mobile device, whether it's a tablet or a smartphone, is the fact that we sometimes tuck bonus content in there. And I got bonus content for you on this episode, because I wanted to tell you a little story about what I've been doing recently. Um, It's sort of genealogy related, it's history related. And it's just fun and dorky and a little piece of um, my life. So I just wanted to share that with you. And it was originally recorded using Periscope. Now, if you follow the newsletter and you know that we did our live Periscope sessions from RootsTech, I'm going to keep doing Periscope sessions as I can, um, kind of fit it in. So sometimes it's just random. Sometimes we schedule them. This was random. So if you have the free Periscope app on your mobile device and you probably got a little tweet tweet that I came online. And you may have watched me live. We had um, several people on there watching us live, but then we record it as a video. And that is your bonus content this week. So enjoy just a little piece of my life. Thank you for sharing your life with me. Thank you for sharing this last hour with me. I know there's lots out there to listen to. And I am really proud of the fact that you come and listen to us here at Genealogy Gems. Thank you for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon. 